I'm in conversation now with Kumelo Bigo, the author of Black Consciousness, A Love Story, one he knows only too well and too intimately, the son of struggle stalwarts Stephen Bigo as well as Mampele Rampele. He's got so much to tell us. This is a memorialization, it is an ode to history and it is also a clarion call for the future. Very excited to chat to you, Kumelo Bigo, welcome. Camilo Bigo, you've uh, just published Black Consciousness, a love story, both elements that are critical to your life, mm. the Black Consciousness story and the love story. And mm. I particularly love this title um, because Black Consciousness is about love mm. and about self-love. Is, is that what you were trying to get across with the title? Yes, this is the first book where I've had the title first. Normally when you write a book, kind of title emerges somewhere around chapter three or chapter four. Uh, and this book, to me, um, conceptualized itself through that title. And my sense every time I've met somebody that was part of this movement is that self-love and love for their colleagues seem to be the bedrock of everything that they're doing. And everybody talks about self-love, the importance of it, but the depth that you see and the quality of relationships that they have with each other um, really blew, blows you away and, and makes you nostalgic to think about a time when people operated at that level. So for me, the Black Consciousness was an obvious uh, part of the title, but the love story was more about the self-love and the love for each other. And then the emergent part of it, obviously, is this narrative that is the source of my life these two people that fell in love and uh, whilst doing something incredibly daring and dangerous uh, found the space to uh, create a love story within it and so I think the combination uh, made sense for me. You rightly say this isn't one, this isn't your first book. I'm curious, um, such a big story about your life, why this book now mm. and why at this time in history because the message around self-love, and I want to touch on something that you mentioned very early on in the book, um, is that it gave its adherents a deep sense of human connectedness and the awareness of the individual's capacity for a change based on self-knowledge and pride in the preservation of the dignity of all men and women. Is this a self-knowledge that you feel is timed for now for you? Yes, and, and I think it's not just about me. It's a... It's, uh... The temperature that I got from speaking to people around the country last year and this year is that we are profoundly disappointed with ourselves. And in that disappointment, we are searching for different models of the same uh, flavor of leadership that we've seen in the past. Mm. And so uh, there's many people that are in a position to talk about different types of leadership models, but this particular one was so in my face when I was hearing these different conversations that it made sense for me to think about exploring. And that exploration started uh, when my aunt died, sadly, and made me think about the personal part of the story and how I would tell it to my kids. And to me, my aunt dying was kind of the last of many of these siblings of my father and close relatives that are from a generation that is seemingly disappearing uh, as time goes by. And so I wanted to make sure that I'm in a position to interview the remaining people that are around to tell the story about uh, thinking about leading differently, uh, leading a, a life differently and uh, having a different type of personal sense of accountability. And that got me along the journey and those interviews that I've had with um, the people that are responsible for the story uh, made it a, a really easy book to write. So to answer your question directly, the previous books that I'd written were about topics that are of interest to me. This book was uh, me replying to a call for a topic that I think was of interest to people in the country and, and somewhat around the world. 
So I felt I was doing a service uh, by putting the story out there, and I hope that people took it the way that uh, I, I intended them to, to interact with it. All right. It's important to indicate um, it's often, you know, that the story, particularly between your parents, is led by the Steve Beagle part of Steve Beagle and Mampila mm -hmm. Um But she plays as massive a role uh, in that leadership as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I found it interesting throughout um, reading this that we've obviously heard a lot of her side of her story in mm -hmm. Mampele alive. Mm -hmm. We've heard a part of your father's story in I Write What I Like, so mm -hmm. we have a good sense of them. And so I, I ask you, is it that easy a story to tell? Everybody seems to have a version. Yes, yes. I think it's like that in all of our lives. You ask two people that got married, when they met, when they fell in love, who proposed. There's always different answers to those questions. And uh, the reason why I wanted to make sure that this book is uh, encapsulated with a set of uh, real live interviews that I, I ran with the people that were there was to get the different perspectives because, uh, you know, Every narrative has a subjective element. And I was pleasantly surprised by how similarly people remembered the facts. Uh, what I felt had been done a disservice before was that uh, people didn't start the story of my parents when it started. So they caught the story kind of halfway along the way and filled in the, the gaps of what happened before and after. And so uh, it's ironic that me and you are talking because your mother introduced my parents. Yes. <laughs> which, so I'm, I'm completely indebted to you. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't around. there, as you know. Yes. And so, so, yeah. so I think that part of the story was not as well told as it should have been. And then the, the narrative also that's formed is that uh, these people uh, had a fairly easy life and, and decided uh, when and when uh, when and when not to interrelate. And mm -hmm. I think what you find in a movement like the Black Consciousness Movement is the external events dictate every part of your life, including your love life. So banning orders, uh, you know, decisions about uh, which part of the country to be based in, um, being arrested. All of these things were major factors in their life and, and you needed to tell the narrative as a thread for you to contextualize how these events shaped them and shaped their story and uh, and and how their love story kind of withstood all of that. I was pleasantly surprised uh, by some discoveries as well. So I find I had the wrong end of the stick about when things started mm. and, and how things developed. And it was interesting to navigate that, maybe partly because as a child, you don't ask lots of questions of yeah. the parents. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I, I took at face value. I, you know, I, as you say, filled in the gaps for myself. There's the introduction um, of, of your parents. And then part of the idea around the love story is this also was very much a story of a love interrupted. Yes. Um, interrupted both for your parents, mm -hmm. for a nation, mm -hmm. um, the outpouring of love uh, in the passing on of your father, mm -hmm. um, the the interruption of almost you. Um, yes. You know, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about how the first interruption, mm. um, when they had hoped to marry yes. and, um, how that played out, and how does that how does that affect the way you see, the way you perceive the story of you? Well, I think that's the saddest part of it, mm -hmm. because you know relationships are a culmination of all these risks that you've taken, uh, the bets that you make about which direction to go in life, and these two people survived missteps and uh, also decisions that they made that maybe they weren't the people for each other and uh, choices that took them in different directions. And they get to this place where you, if you were watching a movie, it would be the happy ever after part. Right. And as you call it, the interruption then happens at that point. And uh, as, as we've seen in South Africa, typically it is the female that gets left to pick up the pieces mm -hmm. when these things happen. And I don't think that we uh, respect and and 
and uh, take into into context the level of pain that it takes for somebody like a Winnie Mandela to be in the position that she was for my mother to go through what she went through and and I'm sure for your mother at some mm -hmm. points in her life too it, there was this dislocation and these things are narratives that are not usually spoken about because mm -hmm. we see our heroes as finished products at the end but there are families involved there's kids involved there's love involved and I thought that that's an important part to bring to the fore um, because I think uh, it's something that we can all relate to. Uh, we've all had instances like that where we felt that we had the most beautiful thing, things that we've been waiting for and it gets interrupted by something. So, and then obviously uh, my own story of, of, you know, the time when I almost died the same day as my father was, I heard this for the first time. Um, when I was doing my interview, wow. so I didn't know about this, and and it was, uh, you know, it gives you goosebumps to listen to how that played out, and and the irony, and uh, the could have been of that situation, yeah. and so I thought that 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 episode needed its own kind of space, and it worked out that that almost is in the middle of the book. Correct. So it, it, it ties both sides of the book together. It certainly does. So I have jumped ahead as well. Um, so let's go back to the start and let's talk about the other love that I really appreciated um, was one that was already instilled. I mean, you speak about the turning point in your parents' lives that um, were the Volta when mm -hmm. they realized that activism was for them, mm -hmm. that standing up for, the, for being a strong black person was for them. But well before each that, that each of those moments in each of their narratives is a thoroughly established love. Yes. Um, a love of education. Yes. All the way back to their grandparents. Um, a love for them, a reminder, uh, if you're not gonna yes, yes. you know, if you're not gonna love yourself, who will? Yes. Um, and they were always affirmed. Yes. Would you say that that is a greater basis for how they responded to those? moments that became defining in their political uh, journey. In other words, might they always have been the heroes they became? Yeah, I think leadership is always this interface between the moment and the preparation of the person for the moment. Yeah. And I think that works out in every society the same way. If you think about um, the story of Martin Luther King and, and him and his dad and that relationship that they had as a, a life that was always going to be a preacher's life mm. and it gets interrupted and he becomes a leader. But when you go backwards and you trace the narrative, he was being prepared. Mm. Uh, and, and whether you believe in a higher power that prepares you or whether you take it as a luck of the draw, but I think you need a bit of both. So these two people came from an affirming background, as you say, but I think that that affirming background was an aspect that was much more common in that time than you think. So if you grew up in a rural area and your parents were lucky enough to be semi-professionals of some kind, you were going to come from a fairly strong, grounded um, household that would give you the ability um, to receive affirmation. Now, not everybody was lucky enough to get it. There were killings back then, there yeah. were people that died, there was people that got sick, so those things happened. But they just happened to have these two very strong, almost twins of, of uh, mothers. Yeah. Uh, and I got to know both of them separately and got to see the two of them together. And they were very similar. And the similarities were values-based similarities in terms of what it means to work hard, what it takes to uh, command respect, uh, regardless of your social status, uh, faith. I think both of them were incredibly strong from a faith-based um, interface with other people. And then they had parents that had taught them about what it means to be a person. So Ubuntu in the real sense of the word. And so uh, I think my parents were very similar uh, in terms of their upbringing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were both superstars in big families from these grounded uh, mothers and uh, with fathers that had played a role but hadn't completed the role for, for health, you know, right. because they passed away and right. things of that nature. So, but having the fathers was important because they had the role models. So it was a complete set of uh, uh, 
childhood experiences that they both had. So they had confidence, they had uh, all of those things that come from um, affirmed households. And I think that combined with the fact that they were, happened to be brilliant people and did well at school formed the uh, combination that you need in order to become a good leader. And when you listen to my mother talk, she makes no bones about the fact that she arrived on campus completely um, unequipped to become the person that she was at the end. Yeah. And so she credits your mom for helping her look the way she looked. Yeah. She loved the go-go boots. Yeah, 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 helping her, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, learn what city life is about because she mm. was a very rural person. She credits uh, my father and, and the group of leaders that they spent weekends and, and weekdays with in terms of setting the bar on the content uh, of, uh, of of conversation that they were going to have. And, and so she learned these tools um, very quickly, but the foundation that she had was very solid. So it was easy for her to then incorporate the jargon and the narrative that comes from reading what she read, but into a very centered uh, personal um, personality type. Yeah. And then in their formative years, comes this intensification of apartheid that says, no, you're not. Yes. You're not smart. Yes. You're not great. Yes. You're not deserving. Yeah. Um, you know, the two the two moments, obviously, at, at, at Lovedale, yeah. um, when your father is um, not expelled, rather, but excluded, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then for, for your mom, it's um, when her family is now moved off, uh, sorry, uh, Kur. Yeah, out, out, of, out of the Sopansberg side and, and moved. Correct. Yeah. Um, and and I'm also thinking of moments when she's told you can't possibly succeed as a scientist, yeah. as a black woman. Yeah. And it's interesting because these opinions often and, and assertions often continue today. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think a completely changed political backdrop, mm. right, mm. where you should be getting affirmed mm. about your black consciousness mm. uh, and your love story mm. with yourself, mm. that still leaves people, you know, still leaves people questioned. Yes. How do you think they might react to that today? So let's put it into context. The Job Reservation Act, I think it was 1956, that set the, the barriers up on what they can and cannot do from mm. a physical point of view. That had started a little bit earlier. Um, if you read books of Madiba and, 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 and people of his generation, they were already seeing opportunities cut off and being forced to do right. things that, that weren't within their normal career path. So uh, they were living as the first and second generation of South Africans that are dealing with this new reality. So I think that that, that was obviously uh, a shock to the system because they would have started their education journeys expecting to be whatever they can, being told at home, you can be whoever you want to be. And then finding themselves being curtailed yeah. by you know factors that are outside of their control. So I think that was a big portion of the politicization. Uh, the, the fight back that they had against the institutionalized racism that, that uh, allowed the Job Reservation Act to be a norm, uh, I think is the same dynamic that we are dealing with now without the laws. Mm. So we've got a institutionalized um, glass ceiling for people that are already in uh, jobs, but then you've still got the same kind of institutionalized network of, within networks that keeps people out. Even despite black economic empowerment, right? Or, or... And actually probably in a, in a twisted way because of it. Because right. what you have now is the way black economic empowerment was supposed to have worked is by now, we're supposed to have the majority of the economy run and owned by black people mm. who would be the ones that are bringing in new people. Mm. And so what we found is 25 years later, um, because we've accepted this principle that we can take small parts of companies and not control them, or be in middle management and not uh, be enabled to rise to you know places where we can actually have authority. We now are finding that there's you know sequential generations of people that can't be absorbed into the economy. 
And I think now we are learning uh, how a combination of aversive racism and unpreparedness uh, from the point of view of our current leaders to create an affirming environment for young people. So all of those uh, factors that, uh, that led to uh, apartheid being an effective exclusion mechanism are now playing out uh, in a post-democratic South Africa without uh, any individual actor that's stopping things but the system that's been created has just been continued mm. uh, from pre and pre-democracy to post-democracy without the necessary tripwires in place in order to ensure that affirmation becomes part of the uh, infrastructure of every institution in South Africa in order to uh, get the best people in the best positions and then to support them. So we've had this combination of uh, having young professionals uh, over-promoted sometimes, mm -hmm. under-supported all the time, mm -hmm. um, uh, misled sometimes, and then those that do survive and get to leadership positions, they find themselves on an island where they don't fit into a natural network that would be a supporting and enabling environment. So all of those factors uh, play out to make it difficult for a leadership pipeline of good black professionals to be the norm. Yeah. Stop describing my career. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, all right. So uh, what you find obviously is a form of gatekeeping both from those who were previously advantaged and I guess have that anxiety mm -hmm. about being pushed out mm -hmm. and a gatekeeping from those who are overpromoted, mm -hmm. right? Uh, black people who are overpromoted because yes. Don't expose me. Yes. You know, if you're, you're if you're an intelligent professional. Yes. Um, and and then also this the the fact that people get into these offices and are not free to be themselves. Right. And I think that's the biggest takeaway that I got from listening to how black consciousness was supposed to play out as a post democratic phenomenon. It was to create a South Africans that are free to be themselves in a country that they feel like they own and we haven't managed to do it. We haven't. So let's go back to the genesis once more. Yes. At university, mm -hmm. um, the establishment of the South African Students' Organization mm -hmm. is a reaction to something similar to what you described, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, where you've got NUSAS mm -hmm. um, as a grouping of liberal my people who are trying to push back against an, a racist narrative and your father says, well, fundamentally people love to quote black man, you're on your own, mm -hmm. but um, you know, your father says this is, it's inappropriate for us not to have this ability to control the narrative as to how we fight racism. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, again, an expression of self-love. Yes. yes. Um, how much of that, self-determination do you see playing out i suppose in today's more vocal uh, and more present more visible leaders well i think there's a generational gap i think that there are those that came through the fees must fall type mm. ranks who are now leaders um you know a lot of them in the eff some of them in the nc some of them in business some of them in ngos who embody the spirit of um, we feel like it's our time to now put a, a stamp, a cultural stamp on leadership as opposed to leading uh, in name only. So I think that's one uh, generational dynamic. I think the generation that has uh, struggled with that, it's kind of our age group and mm -hmm. above. Okay, so, and I think we came in in a negotiated settlement environment okay. and we took a negotiated um, transformational approach. And so every interaction that we had was about making sure that when we come into a space, we're not stepping on toes. Mm. And when we are in the space, uh, we are inclusive in the way that we take ownership of the space. And I think that that has been overdone because we, we've we tended from a cultural point of view to accommodate um, aspects of South African culture 
which are there but shouldn't be the dominant aspect. Mm. We've taken um, a, a accommodationary posture as well to older people who came before us. We didn't fill the space as a generation the way that previous generations did. So we accommodated generationally and interracially and and from a, from from a strategy point of view in terms of how we do transformation, and I think the 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 fruits of that have made this gap of militant thirty year old thirty five year olds and the gap between them and the last militant uh, ranks being you know quite a big one because mm. we didn't fill that space and and yet. To be fair to our generation, mm. I still think our values are closer to the previous. So you have the further and you have the strength of the 30 plus militant mm -hmm. mil without the same value. Mm -hmm. One of the examples I wanted to ask you about, for example, is the importance of Uncle Strini Moodley, and Sam, um, Uncle Sats Cooper yeah. um, being representative of, I guess one could call it an Indian caucus on campus and mm -hmm. all of their understanding that actually the oppressed race mm -hmm. is one. And suddenly we have this introduction, notwithstanding what had started in apartheid, which is four races, yes. uh, that there was oppressive race, but mm -hmm. black is for all of us. Yeah. Um, and when I question the values of the militant, I'm asking more about the anti-Indian sentiments that you get from some of some of our political leaders at this at mm. this particular point about the notion of colored people who, even when I want to say, you know. Black say, mm. I'm self-determined, you right, know. Right. Um, in present times, I can think of the EFF, I can think of the um, the, the Cape Colored Congress who, who want that sense of self-determination, but in silos. Right. So same militants, not quite the same values, mm. and maybe not the same militants from our generation, mm. but I would probably say more um, coordinating, more, I suppose, a kind of value that's moving towards an outcome that is supposed to be great for all of us, even if it were negotiated. So, so which is the right path? Yeah. So I'll answer that in three ways. I think identity is an independent prerogative. Mm. So everybody has a prerogative to say, I identify with this. That's at one level. And that's part of the freedom that we fought for is the ability to self-determine, the ability to self-associate. So. So in a, in a vacuum, that should be allowed and lauded, right? And I think that's part of what we got taught from a generational point of view, right. which is that is the environment that you're getting into, the whole Rainbow Nation backdrop of our early adulthood um, was, was, was based on this idea that self-determination was going to be uh, possible because now we're free. Here's the second part of, of, of that. Self-determination only works within an environment where the rules are clear. We hadn't clarified the rules. So we, uh, we said we want an, a non-racial society, but we kept the labels that came from the apartheid racist labels. So race as a concept doesn't exist. We know this. It's not a biological concept. The only way it can exist is um, as one set of people who are privileged, another set of people that aren't privileged. That's the only way a race can exist as a concept. So you either eradicate the privilege, right? And at the same time, eradicate the categories mm. such that you can facilitate this issue of self-determination. If you don't do that, then you are leaving people with an option to either voluntarily leave their privilege which almost nobody ever does. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or, or have to fight and scrape to attain privilege and status, which again is very, very difficult in a context where there's institutional uh, structures that are in place like South Africa. So the third part of it is that it then takes on economic uh, connotations because um, what this generation that we're talking about, the militant generation that's coming behind us, is reacting to a status quo that stayed in place right. and gone backwards in many ways. So what they're saying is what we observe is that despite your uh, various uh, uh, members of this generation and the generation above you saying that race doesn't matter, it's time to self-determine, it's kumbaya, we should hold hands <laughs> and, 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 and associate as South Africans. What we observe from the economy is that that's not how it looks. 
every time we look mm. up at the statistics, black people are the poorest, black people are, are the most unemployed. Are, you know, most unemployed, we're, you know, living in, in, in the worst parts of the country. So the paradigm that said, wait until the natural uh, economy kind of reshapes itself. Um, that card doesn't work anymore with young people. What young people are saying is we observe that this thing is not going to come without us forcing it. And the problem is that then there's a rear guard action by those that are in the position of privilege mm. to say we want to find ways of retaining this privilege. Protect. Can we pick and choose who is going to be running the transformation agenda? Yeah. Can we pick and choose uh, what's the narrative around our participation in helping transformation. So now all of a sudden it becomes a game of semantics of people saying, well, I'm doing so much for the country, mm -hmm. but at the same time, that militant uh, group of young people is watching them saying, actually, no, you're not. Compared to what you've got, what you're doing is uh, a, a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very complicated issue. You still have to deal with the fundamental bedrock of it is that there is uh, no reason why 25 years, 26 years after uh, democracy, we are still having this conversation mm. about the correlation between race and economics. You have to break the correlation in order to get society to normalize. And without breaking that correlation, what you're going to get is this boom bust cycle of we're, we're rainbow nation mm. three, four years later. No, we're not. Right. And every time it swings from one side to the other, it's going to be more violent, as we've seen this year. If we can then now look at a different form of privilege that I, mm -hmm. I wanted to explore with you, and that's male privilege. Sure. This is something that's spoken about quite a bit within the Black Consciousness Movement. Yes. Um, as you detail in the book, by the time your mom comes to University of Natal, yep. my mom is in leadership alongside your father yep. of the SYC yep. and also in Sasso. Yep. Um, Auntie Sam uh, Moodley is there, but with her husband, yeah. Uncle Streamy, um, and the leadership is largely male. It's Uncle Bonnie Pichana. It's 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 a largely male kind of dominated leadership. Um, you know, what's the role of women, in your opinion, uh, coming from such a strong mother herself um, in the Black Consciousness movement? I think that Black Consciousness did better than most political organizations in the world in terms of the role of women and, and just in terms of the, uh, the lack of discrimination as to what and how women can participate mm -hmm. in and uh, what was the format of a woman leader in terms of perception. Mm -hmm. right? I think from the beginning the perception was that we are a group of 15 people I think six of them or seven of them were women mm -hmm. and in that context we are equals, we speak, um, you know, without having to censor ourselves, mm -hmm. we put our opinions forward. And I think uh, the conversations that I've had with the people about those early times show that there was a spirit of, uh, of camaraderie that didn't have a gender uh, veil uh, that said, you know, it's your women's league is where you guys talk, but mm. here it's... <laughs> There wasn't that, right? Okay. So the first uh, president of the political wing of the BCM was a woman. Right? Okay. And so I think that they are those things. However, what me and you know is that the same uh, privilege uh, preservation strategies that lead to racism are the same privilege preservation strategies that lead to sexism. And so we failed across both for the same reasons, which is that we never broke the old boys networks that were in charge of the institutions pre and post apartheid, okay. right? So just look at it statistically, right? If uh, you have 80% of an organization that is one type of person, they're going to pick the next leaders mm. and they start with their network. Mm. And if their network is like them, uh, the chances are that they're going to replicate themselves, and that's happening across companies, across uh, you know uh, nonprofit organizations. It's better in government, 
Uh, if you look at South African government, yes. we've performed far better because from the beginning, there were strong women in positions of power. And so those networks have replicated themselves accordingly, right? So we have to break uh, the paradigm that says that, uh, you know, when you went to the school, if your brother went there, uh, then you've got an advantage because you get to nominate a family that comes in. Because if you do that, all of our private schools are going to have the same texture 20 years later. Well, they, they, they kind of do. She had a real... No, that's what I'm saying. Right. That's what I'm saying. We right. have to break that. Yeah. Because if you have that rule uh, in place, it plays itself out generationally, where the same group of people continue to harbor power. And so that's on the private school side. And public schools, I think you've got a different dynamic. The teachers are reflective of where the students are going to go. Mm. So I think public school teachers are still... Uh, have that same segregation that we've experienced mm. in, in good and bad institutions. And I think that's where you have to fight the gender battle. It has to be on role modeling. It has to be on the basis of, uh, again, affirmation. And that affirmation is very difficult when uh, the girl doesn't see herself represented in positions of power. So just summary of what I'm saying is that from the black consciousness point of view, they were better than others. They didn't need a women's league because they had women in power in a lot of their positions. But again, it wasn't 50-50, which is supposed to be the way it looks like if you just let things play out according to how nature works, right? Um, so, so it's a relative issue. And then from pre-democracy to post-democracy, we've kept the uh, male patrimony as the dominant form of organization around our leadership. And that plays out. Um, with kind of the results that show that managers in the country are still predominantly mm. male. Um, and you, you look at uh, administrative, administrative tasks, tasks parliament and things of that nature. So I think we've got a long road to go for the same reasons. We, we have to break the paradigm that says that we trust people that look like us to take up positions of power after us. You have to break that paradigm. I'm with you. I think what you're describing in terms of how the black consciousness movement responded to women um, mm -hmm. or embraced women or mm -hmm. was women as mm -hmm. much as it was men mm -hmm. um, is definitely something I'm familiar with, whether it's watching my parents or the stories. Sure. But since then, and it's one of the reasons I'm asking you, mm -hmm. you know, your Aunt Bundy, mm -hmm. who precipitated his passing and um, precipitated the writing of this book. Yeah. Auntie, Strini, Auntie Sam Moodley, your yep. mom and I contributed to this anthology yes, yes. last last year, yes. um, A Time to Remember yep. uh, Reflections of Women from the Black Consciousness Movement, yep. in which they lament. Great book, by the way. I mean, <laughs> it actually really is. It's, yeah. a, it's a really I wonderful collection reading, of yeah. stories. And, mm. and it was an interesting lamentation that not necessarily blaming the men of the black consciousness movement, but certainly blaming the patriarchy of the world yes. that they've in many respects, unless they're um, discussed amongst people like ourselves for whom this is a, a big deal that we yes. research it, their names are not echoed in the same way that Steve Beagle or Hopo get, yes. get echoed, right? Yes. In the halls of, of history. Yes. In the, actually, in, in reference to what you said a little earlier, the, the Winnie Mandela memory is not the same as that that people hold yes. of uh, Nelson Mandela and, of course, people are far less forgiving yes. of probably similar sacrifices that each would have had to make. And, and I, I guess my question to you is, you know, what is that legacy that we need to, to, to revisit? Bes besides asking people to allow us space, because I think the, the, I'm referring to Anbandi, I'm, I'm, ref I'm referring to Anmanpila, I'm, I'm referring to Ansam, because I think that they have been able to navigate the world. Yes. Without and having to ask, barriers. correct. Without having to ask permission. Yes. Uh, so what is it that the world has to do in, in response? Because... You know. well, I, that's why I think the battle is about the pipeline. It's, yeah. it's not about the world. It's about how the next generation of girls see themselves right. in leadership. right? And I think that we are doing better on that score than we think. If you travel around the world, you realize how, uh, how big a gap it is in terms of uh, you know, females in um, the arts, females in... Uh, roles of responsibility in politics and things of that nature. Where, where the problem comes is a cultural one where we have to make that final step towards seeing 
uh, the black woman professional as a norm. And I think that's a, that's a cultural issue that got lost um, uh, when, you know, black consciousness fell apart in the, in the late 70s. And we went back to kind of liberation politics as usual. Mm. And the way liberation politics works, at some point, the men were predominant in fighting. Mm. And it comes our turn to kind of rule because we kind of fought for this. And, and you had that dynamic that happened, um, whether willingly or unwilling, in terms of the cultural element that, uh, that happened post-94, where it became more male-dominated than it should be. But I think that it's, it's, it's now time for, and, and our president has spoken about this, and many male leaders speak about this publicly, but I think it's time for us to uh, ensure that we develop cultures of affirmation across the board. And, and this for me is a, it's a question of affirming uh, young and uh, young professionals and young girls that are coming into these spaces of leadership to position them not to ask and just take the mm. opportunities that are in front of them or make the opportunities mm. that come. And I think that that's, again, uh, it's more of a problem in our generation than the one behind us. The one right. behind us, I think, is much more affirmed, even on a gender basis, than ours. Interesting. Um, yeah. You referred just now to the tail end of the Black Consciousness Movement, mm -hmm. Sprout, yes. Chapter 9, yes. in particular the 11th of September. Uh, the way you opened this chapter was actually quite jarring or profound to me. And I know you mentioned that you you only recently found this out, but I was, I was born under truly strange circumstances. In fact, I almost died on the same day as my father. I... I I struggle to fathom uh, spiritually. How do you accept that kind of that kind of proximity to him, mm. having missed him? Mm. Um, the, it was just the following day that he uh, was brutally murdered, mm. or that his injuries uh, came uh, to fatality. Mm. You could never have known. But how, how do you reckon with that in life today? Yeah, it's a difficult thing to, to think about because I think parents uh, for a period of time are supposed to be larger than life and infallible and then you worry about their old age. And so my life was kind of inverse mm. where I grew up into this larger than life um, legacy of somebody that's not here. So for me, I think that that, that chapter was uh, the the one that I wrote um, feeling most connected to him mm. in a funny way because I hadn't allowed myself to go through those emotions and that conversation because I'm not a person that wallows in self-pity or even what ifs. I'm, I'm not that type of person. I'm not wired like that. So it was the first time I allowed myself to go there and, and really interact with uh, the connectivity that comes from um, the way he died and the way I was born. And uh, it was, I was tired at the end of writing that chapter because it, it was draining. And, uh, but to answer your question, I think if you go back to the way African people understand ancestors, uh, it's a temporal thing, the way we think about time. So there's a continuum of time that goes from generations before to behind you. And there's no break in that continuum. So the way we've always thought about death isn't with the same finality that Western people think about death. Mm -hmm. For us, death is about joining a graduation of a class of people that are still in a different realm operating the way we operate now. And I've always believed that without knowing what that means. And, you know, as an African person who grows up in a Christian culture, you actually have to work your way through how do you link these two parts of your of your faith and uh you know speaking to uncle Madison Bumlana, who, mm. who is probably the most evolved thinking in this area i've been able to clarify that for myself and i think there's no contradiction between the two because if you think about the way christianity speaks about saints and speaks about you know all souls and things mm -hmm. of that nature uh, the the embedded message beneath is that there is a realm where 
people who have done great things and have passed on, their life doesn't get cut. It's a different way of, of, of manifesting a life. And so I've always believed that. So I didn't have that sadness that this guy is underground and doesn't live anymore, or whatever it is. I, I have this feeling that he's always there and that there is a, a part of me that, um, that feels connected um, in whichever way to, to um, his spirit as a person. And I think uh, that came across certainly in the journey of writing and connecting again um, in a formal way. Uh, but I feel it when I go and visit uh, where he's uh, buried and I feel it when I'm with his friends and with his family and uh, listening to people speak about him. Uh, there is a, a, a spiritual dimension that, uh, that uh, becomes very obvious that big presence like him doesn't disappear. Yeah. And same feeling I had, uh, having been lucky enough to get to know Madiba when he passed out. I still have the same uh, feeling if I go to Kunu, I feel his presence uh, in a different way. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's part of my faith and not everybody would think that way. But that's what allows me to, to cope and not feel like there's some uh, major struggle to get over. I, I think I'm one of many, many South Africans that for different reasons, I've grown up without a father. And I've just been lucky to have um, family and a support structure that compensates for that in a way that, you know, African uh, culture maintains a really seamless way of stepping into that breach when, when a child grows up without a father. So I've had, I've had uh, more than enough um, support from my family, let me put it that way. Oh. Thanks for pouring into that chapter because it, it was felt. Mm. Um, I won't give anything away because I think reading line by line and juxtaposing that with what one knows mm. from newspaper clippings, from anecdotes, from you know just the history books, it's uh, it's incredibly moving. And I'm even more moved to know when you mentioned earlier on that your mum had never shared with you that mm. difficult time. Mm. Um, does she protect you from a lot of that history? Well, I think they, I say it in the book that they, there's some things that I intuitively know not to dwell on mm. because I can't imagine anything more painful for her to speak about. If you, if you really think about the loss that she must have felt at that time and um, the things that about me remind her of that moment and, and others. I think it's a, it's a it, it, from a sensitivity point of view, it's something that we just naturally don't speak a lot about. But in this process, I think we got to speak for weeks and weeks about this. Um, and uh, she got to unload some things that she didn't uh, have a time to tell me when I was younger. And I got to extract some things that I didn't have the guts to ask when I was younger. So I think it was, it was a, a good way of putting some of those things to bed. Uh, in terms of uh, conversations that were open threads. All right. Um, so that is the bridge, as you mentioned. This book is as much about memorializing the history, the love, mm. um, putting it on paper, the legacy, mm. as, as it is about your putting forward your perspectives about the future. That's right. Um, and I've deliberately tried to juxtapose that in today's discussion. but. Yep. Um, let's, let's get a little bit more specific about where you go with the book, um, mm -hmm. looking at black consciousness movement within the ANC, for yes. example. I found it interesting that you characterized it that way. I've always wondered if, I always thought it had been hijacked, or your father's memory feels sometimes hijacked by the ANC because of what, of the break, you know, between the end, towards the last, the, the, the end of the 70s, and moving into a kind of different kind of, um, liberation movement uh, momentum in the mm. 80s. Mm. Uh, does that never, that you never have that sense? No, I don't. I, I think one piece of perspective I try to bring to people is the fact that my father was always very clear that the ANC needed to lead us out mm. of apartheid. And so his efforts to set up a, what he called a, a cultural movement was to infuse something into what he called a vanguard 
So he separated those two things intellectually, and he said it in a few interviews, mm. um, which people can see for themselves. So it was always the intention that uh, the ground needed to be prepared for when ANC leadership um, is in a position to come back to South Africa and partner with people on the ground to transform the country. Mm. That was the framing. And I think that because there was this gap between, you know, 77 and when people started to speak about black consciousness again publicly, mm. um, there, there isn't a clarity with people about what happened. So what I try and do in the book is to show that there are three things that happened. Number one is the NC took a lot of great black consciousness leadership into the fold. Mm. And that was enabled by banning orders and the death of the top leadership. So that wouldn't have happened. So if history had played out uh, the way my father thought, there would have been an independent movement uh, working alongside the ANC as opposed to individuals inside the ANC who believed in a set of beliefs that mm -hmm. came from black consciousness. So I think that's important. The second thing that's important is to understand that those leaders that went into exile and became part of the ANC, um, whether it be in the rest of the African continent or in Europe, uh, they had all the hopes that they were bringing this philosophy to the ANC. But you know what happens when an individual joins an institution, the dilution effect mm. is, is, is never going to be in the direction of the individual. So I think that's also an important thing is there wasn't a deliberate attempt to say we don't want any of this black consciousness philosophy inside the ANC. It was just that um, it's very difficult for individuals to bring the culture, the texture, uh, the way of being uh, that they had developed in that 15 to, you know, group, 15 person group that had widened quite significantly by the time that uh, you know, people started getting arrested in, in 73, 74 and later. Mm. So the dilution effect was a big thing. And, and, and then in terms of the legacy, the other thing I try to bring to the fore is the NC actually ran away from the Steve Bieber legacy mm. and the Black Consciousness legacy because they didn't know how to position it. So they were claiming a success, which is we've helped liberate the country. That was the brand going into 94. So there's this other thing, which is part of the liberation, and they didn't know how to categorize it because it wasn't driven by them. Mm -hmm. And then the person that was driving it um, wasn't here anymore, and the people that were driving it were now inside the organization. Right. So that created this weirdness where BCM was swept under the carpet, and it took a long time between... Uh, 94 and when it was recognized the way it's currently recognized and in recognizing it uh, they've done it through ceremonies so every time you see it it is a ceremony mm. of uh, an anniversary mm. of a death or birth it, uh, june 16th event or whatever it is and and that's where it looks like they're trying to hijack something okay whereas actually it's the opposite it's a rebalancing of something that was lost but because there's this big gap, the narrative has been lost on what's happening. And I think if, if you weren't here and you're not able to bring context to what you're seeing, um, I think you, you don't get the message that I'm delivering. So presumably the fact that it was a compromise also made it difficult to absorb the message as simply uh, in 1994. And one of the things that you speak about in the book is that you believe your father actually would back the idea behind the radical economic transformation, which is not quite the same as the compromise of 94. How would that play out in your mind? It wouldn't be radical if he was alive. Yes. That's the first thing. So the normalization about what is supposed to happen in the economy in South Africa, it, the standard for that has been set by a gradualist black leadership that facilitated something like uh, land reform to sound radical. We did that. Mm. And, and the facilitation uh, was done bit by bit as we went through this negotiated settlement process where we, we got to a place where we were happy with 25% of the economy and we're happy with 25% of the jobs and we're happy with 
you know, 15% of the land, regardless of what we had said we we're going to do, uh, be it in the Freedom Charter, be it in uh, the documents that, uh, that governed how uh, the Black Consciousness Movement was directing themselves. Uh, we, we got to the place where when we were in power, we compromised. So I think Chris Haney, Robert Subuka, Steve Biko would have brought a different texture to those conversations. And I don't think it's a coincidence that all of them are not there. Right. So that's number one. Number two is those leaders that are here knew what those three would have asked for and would have pushed for. Uh, but it's much easier to compromise than to go against the grain. Mm. And, and the nature of the compromise was always that we can kick the can down the road and five years later and ten years later become more militant. But the problem is you're, you're setting standards and normalizing the wrong thing. And expectations. And expectations. No, the expectations were still high. Right. So you had this difference of activity versus expectation. Right. And there was a, a gap that continued to grow every year. And I think why I say that, uh, if you listen to what my father was saying, everything he talked about regarding how the economy should look was based on saying, this is a South African country run by black South Africans because mm. South Africans uh, are 80%, 90% black. Mm. And so for that reason, we need to make sure that uh, the economy looks that way, uh, land distribution looks that way. And he was actually much more for a, uh, a socialist solution mm. because I think there was a wisdom there that you can't have this big period of apartheid followed by capitalism that's winner take all and that they needed to be something in between that balances the scales. And again, we, we, we haven't done that on the premise that we wanted to have a more gradual transformation of the economy, so-called mixed economy that never got mixed. Final question. Um, you're a businessman. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to know from you whether or not you have any political aspirations uh, to bring the love back to the conversation of South Africa. And if not, what do we need to bring the self-love uh, back into black consciousness? I don't think that politics is an arena for aspirations. I think mm. it should be a service arena. Mm. And, and, and I'm speaking idealistically, but it's important to separate those two things. I think you can aspire for things that are in your control. Mm. Like I'd like uh, uh, to you know, get a PhD, I'd like to do X, Y, and Z. These are things that you can aspire to. From my perspective, I think we need a, a different uh, leadership model than we have today. And that's not a knock on the people that are in leadership, it's a fact. And I think uh, they would uh, look in the mirror and accept that uh, where we've gotten to is a place where uh, leaders are chosen not for uh, the track record of service, but much more for the constituency that they represent. And that, that is uh, an outcome of the way that we've constructed our democracy uh, over the last 25 years that needs to change. And I think that there are some gradual things like direct representation at the local level that's now become the norm. And where a community can say, we want Rufila to represent mm. us because she understands our issues. That should be the norm from local all the way up. And at the moment, and I wrote about this in my first book, uh, that that the proportional uh, representation system that dominates South African politics is dangerous because it encourages people to lobby as opposed to to uh, respond to calling from people. And so uh, this issue of who's the principal, who's the agent in politics has never been correctly dealt. So I, I hope that uh, the impatience that we're seeing in terms of the insurrection that happened a few months ago, in terms of the tone that young people are speaking with, and in terms of the way that communities are saying we want to see ourselves represented. I hope that translates to a certain type of leadership that is willing to throw away this gradualist approach to transformation and actually get their hands dirty, become unpopular if they have to, um, 
in service of transforming the spaces that they're in. And so that, that's what I'm looking to, to support. Uh, and that can be within the context of party politics, it can be outside of the context of party politics, or even outside politics in complete, uh, in, uh, completely and, and look at what models can we see uh, in terms of uh, NGO-led leadership that makes a difference on the ground. And uh, I think what needs to change is people like myself cannot sit on the sidelines and say that we can be in business and not deal with the realities that are, are affecting the masses of the people that are ultimately going to make doing business in this country impossible. So I think responding to calls to support and help uh, is something that I'm open to. And I think, I hope that this book inspires other young people who are bright and are connected and are energetic to feel the, the need to respond to, to calls for leadership. Black Consciousness, a love story. Thank you for this really fantastic call to action.